Good evening. A few years ago, we were photographing elephants on the banks of the river Kabini, when in the distance we saw a magnificent tusker. As, as we, were, we were driving up to the elephants, our jeep got stuck in the marsh next to the river. Our driver pressed the accelerator, and the sound of skidding rubber on the mud <clears throat> must have irritated the elephant. And before we knew what was happening, he charged straight at us. I have never experienced anything more frightening then this huge animal, his ears spread out wide, his tusks pointed in our direction, charging at 60 kilometers an hour. And there we were. My son was with me. He was stuck in the mud. And we were actually frozen with fright. Now, fortunately, when he was about 20 feet from us, he stopped. And soon we realized that he had a huge festering wound on his back. Through my binoculars, I could tell that this was most probably a bullet wound. Ivory poachers are active in these parts, and some of them sit on top of trees and wait for these large tuskers to come under them and shoot at them from the top. <clears throat> now, this elephant must have been in excruciating pain. He must have hated human beings. And yet that evening he stopped, turned around, and literally walked away into the sunset of his life. Today, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the emotional intelligence and empathy of the non-human animals that share our planet. <clears throat> there are several recorded examples of such behavior, and I would like to narrate a few of them to you. Humor is not something which is a monopoly of the human being. Coco, <clears throat> a gorilla in an American zoo, had been taught sign language. One day, in fluent sign language, he signaled to his keeper that if she did not hurry up with his food, he would let an alligator loose on her. Uh, Jane Goodall spent a lifetime studying chimpanzees. She tells us of a particularly strong bond that a mother chimpanzee shared with her uh, son, the son she named Flint. When Flint was about eight years old, when Flint was about eight years old, the mother suddenly died. Uh, I think this is better. When uh, his mother suddenly died. Now, Flint was completely devastated. Uh, he spent days next to her listless body, playing with her hair, playing with her face, playing with her hands. And after a while, went to the nest where mother and son had spent many a happy day, lay down quietly and died. Goodall, in her scientific writings, concludes that Flint died of a broken heart. Uh, another biologist called Redmond tells us that on days of exceptionally good foraging, not only do gorillas throw their arms around each other, but they actually sing. In Tanzania, a game warden called uh, Rushby uh, records a very touching story of the courage of two very young elephant calves. Authorities had told him that there were too many elephants in a particular park in Tanzania, and that it was his job to cull or kill a few to restore the balance of nature. So one day he saw four elephants in thick grass. He went on to shoot them. Three females died instantly. One male was slightly injured, but very disoriented. To his horror, he suddenly saw two little calves coming out from the grass. But they were not scared. They moved to the uh, disoriented male, pressed their little bodies against his, and slowly guided him away 
to the safety of another herd. A scientist called Mogridge was studying spiders. He found a rare specimen of a wolf spider, which carries its babies on its young, uh, on its back. Now, this particular mother had about 20 babies. He removed all the babies, picked up the mother, and to preserve the specimen, dropped the mother into a jar of alcohol. After a considerable amount of time, presuming the mother to be dead, he went on to put the babies into the same jar. To his surprise, the mother literally sprang back to life, stretched out its arms, pulled each one of its babies to its chest as if to protect them, and then died. Now in Kenya, rangers tell us of an interesting story of trans-species empathy. A rhino and its cub went to a waterhole. The baby rhino's little legs got caught in the mud. She cried out for help. The mother came back, sniffed the baby, could not tell what the problem was, went back to the bush. Just then a herd of elephants came. A large elephant saw the baby, realized what the problem was, knelt down, and with its long tusks started digging the mud around the baby. Now the mother rhino saw this huge elephant next to its baby and charged at the elephant. Uh, at the elephant. The elephant just managed to escape grievous injury. But as soon as the mother had gone back to the bush, she came back, knelt again, and freed the baby. I'd like to show you today some of the images that I have managed to capture on my camera from our fast disappearing natural world. Sometimes people ask me how, with my visual impairment and 10% vision, I managed to take wildlife photographs and do the things I do. Well, I very strongly believe that a handicap is a burden only if you recognize and accept it as a handicap. Uh, as it is often said, angels fly not because they have wings, but because they carry no burdens. And as far as my wildlife photographs are concerned, I have a very reliable friend who never lets me down, and that is my camera. Now that's the image of a young elephant charging at us, telling us to leave its home, a home that we as human beings far too often invade upon. Tusker enjoying his reflection in the water. An interesting photograph because the slightest of breeze would send ripples and you won't get a perfect uh, reflection. Elephants sparring to establish their dominance. Now this is uh, what I call a flying leopard because its legs are off the ground. Difficult photograph because leopards are normally nocturnal. And for me to get a sharp photograph, I had to pan the camera at exactly the same speed at which this leopard was running and continue to pan it while pressing the shutter. Otherwise, it would just be a blur. Tiger cleaning his claws after making a kill. I often tell people who are very proud that they've shot tigers that it's so much more difficult to get a good photograph than to see a little animal in the distance and put a light on it and kill it. Now here's a lion that has robbed the wildebeest, which was killed by a group of lionesses. So often we enjoy the fruits of other people's labor. Lioness with her cub. Lionesses sharing a tender moment, but more likely sharing some bush gossip. Lions mating in the wild. Zebras. Now, rhinos have been almost killed to extinction. It is believed that their horns possess aphrodisiac qualities. Chemical analysis has shown that it contains nothing different from the human fingernail. Now, this 
uh, I put myself at some risk. Uh, I crept up to these tiger cubs and photographed them. If the mother was anywhere near, she would have attacked. The tiger on a spotted deer kill. Spotted deer is on the ground or below the stomach. A lion greeting the early morning sun, probably praying to it. Cheetahs are very beautiful animals. And it was always my dream to photograph the moment of a cheetah kill because it's so fast and so quick. Veteran photographers had told me that I needed to spend at least a year following a cheetah to be able to photograph the actual moment of a kill. The reason being that four out of five times the prey escapes. On the other times, it's the kill is in thick grass, or there's too much of dust, or it's facing the wrong direction, or it's just too far from you. Fortunately, on the 14th and last day of my trip to Kenya, I managed to get the moment of a cheetah kill. Now, coming back to the title of my talk, I am a dog. Is there really any difference between us? A few, some time ago, we had gathered to celebrate the wedding of Subaya's daughter. Subaya is a great spiritual master who lives in Pur. And he has thousands of disciples. And hundreds of them had gathered on this occasion. A bit overwhelmed and confused by this uh, outpouring of devotion. An uncle of mine asked me, he said, Nirad, what does Subaya mean to you? And without any hesitation, I said, he is a god. Now the disciples gathered around me, were extremely happy with my answer. They shook their head, they smiled, they said, of course Guruji is a god. But my uncle was agitated. He said, wait a minute, you know, Krishna is a god, Buddha is a god, Jesus is a god. But Subaya, I've even seen him drinking whiskey. So I said, okay, 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 let's spell God backwards. He is a dog. Now the disciples were extremely angry. They said, how dare you call Guruji a dog? You must be a dog. My uncle was upset. He said, now you're going too far. He's not a god, but he's certainly not a dog. The whole atmosphere was becoming very volatile, and I beat a hasty retreat from the venue. Fortunately, I met Subaya a few days later, and I went up to him and said, Sir, I am extremely sorry, but I called you a dog. He looked at me, laughed for a long time, and said, the same blissful, universal, indestructible energy that flows through you flows through me, flows through God, flows through a dog. And I am most certainly a dog. Now, this was the elephant that, in spite of a bullet in its back, chose that evening to spare our lives. A few weeks after that incident, I heard that he had succumbed to his injuries. And his body was on the banks of the river Kabini. I went to the spot to pay my respects. Poachers had got to his body before we could. They had sawn off his tusks. They had smashed his skull to get to the few inches of ivory that are buried inside the skull. I was extremely upset. I was angry. It was a very emotional moment for me. And I was probably crying. But through the sadness, a few lines of a poem drifted into my head, and this is how it goes. I am the peace of a meditative soul. I am nothing but the whole. So do not cry, I did not die. I am the stars, I am the sky. Thank you.